Welcome to the seventh lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Waldscheid and today we are going to integrate planning and learning with tabular methods. So far we have discussed already a lot of reinforcement learning solutions for control and prediction and by doing so we especially treated the two domains or two dimensions model free learning and model-based learning. And we have provided you with solution approaches for both kinds of problems. So for example, model-free solution would be Q-learning or Zaza, where we directly trying to derive an, a policy, a solution to our uh, MDP problem or model-based solutions where uh, we first going to start uh, with a model and then trying to derive a solution from that, which could be a dynamic programming, for example. And the day, today's goal is to fuse these two domains here, model-based learning and model-free learning, in order to improve the overall learning process and therefore to derive reinforcement learning solutions which converge faster and better. And of course, as we already yeah, focused on tabular methods, the uh, lectures until today, so uh, we have working on finite state and action spaces, uh, therefore also all discussed um, extensions to the reinforcement learning framework while integrating planning and uh, model-free solutions. I will be, stay, will be still focusing here on the finite state and action spaces. The agenda for today's lecture is summarized here on that slide. First, we will have a little recap on the model-based and model-free reinforcement learning solutions we have discussed so far to highlight uh, different uh, similarities. Then we will integrate them in the so-called DINA framework, which is a framework in order to integrate planning, acting and learning uh, with a backward view. So we will work on previous experience which we have gathered uh, with an interaction of a real environment or based on simulation. Then prioritized sweeping as well as update variants are referring to the Dyna framework with that backward view, working with past experiences or simulated experience from the past. And then planning, planning at decision time will enable us also a forward view of that integration of uh, planning and learning where we are going to predict or simulate possible outcomes of our MDP problem uh, with respect to future state action trajectories. However, this one, our planning at decision time, is more or less an excursion, an outlook to, do to today's uh, lecture, because uh, as we will learn then also that uh, these methods are rather high in computational load and have high latency responses and therefore our focus will clearly lie on the four, uh, first four uh, bullet points here and planning and decision time is more or less only in Outlook. Yeah, first let's recap the model-based reinforcement learning scheme. Here we needed to predict or plan value functions and our policy from a model, so for example, we did that with dynamic programming where we have assumed that we have a full model knowledge of the underlying MDP problem. And from that, we then use that model knowledge in order to yeah, obtain experience or use that experience about the model and then calculate the according value functions or policies. So in this way, we have called that planning because yeah, we have used only a model, we didn't use any, let's say, experience based on an interaction with an exterior environment, but we were just using internal an internal knowledge representation of a given environment. And the question is, of course, if we are using that model as an important instance of model-based reinforcement learning, then of course, we uh, should also dig a little bit deeper in terms of what is a model. 
first of course we can recap that in an MDP sense a model can be stated as a tuple consisting out of the state space, action space, the state transition probability, the reward probability and if we are in a discounted problem then also the discount factor gamma. And in order to use such a model, which we summarize here with that symbol M in a reinforcement learning environment, we of course need this state transition probability in order to make predictions or at least to simulate something in terms of the transition from a given state, taking a certain action to a new state, successor state. And of course, as we need to predict or evaluate the state values or action values, we also need the reward probability um, being in a certain state, picking a certain action in order then to gain knowledge about the value of a certain state action combination or also then of certain policies which will maximize this. As a base assumption, which is yeah trivial, but just to mention it also, of course we assume that the state space and the action spaces uh, are known a priori so we know let's say the inputs and outputs of our environment where we can uh, interact with now, of course um, this is required in order to yeah to plug in our actions and then to receive a state feedback but just to mention that also formally here and yeah the discount factor I've discussed that a lot during the last lectures and it could be either given by the environment for example in the financial sector the discount factor could be interpreted in some sense of an interest rate and in this case it would be like naturally given by the environment or in technical control sense the engineer might choose the discount factor accordingly in order to ensure or to improve certain learning performances. And the model itself, uh, we can distinguish, let's say, two major branches in terms of what the model is. For the dynamic programming case, we have worked with something like a true MDP model. So uh, we assumed that our knowledge about the environment by, uh, given by that model is perfect. However, this is normally not the case in, in many applications. So control engineering, uh, for example, we may have a model representing a certain system, but in most cases we cannot assume that this model is 100% accurate. In games, of course, there might be the case that uh, we um, have full knowledge about the rules of the games and stuff like that in order to uh, make a full perfect model. However, if that is for example a game where um, multiple players are interacting with each other or um, are being opponents acting against each other, then of course part of that model would be also to predict what our opponent or our opponents are doing. And of course this is very unlikely to uh, assume that we have a perfect opponent model here because every player um, of course is somehow acting a little bit differently and therefore in most cases let's say realistic cases we have to work with an approximation so m hat in order to highlight that our model is only uh, roughly uh, exactly the, the true model is only roughly depicting the true uh, system dynamics in MDP sense and in this case we can state that we are operating in an approximated MDP problem space. So in most cases as I said we don't have a perfect model at hand. There are only some exam uh, some exceptions like the RIT world case. However in most other cases we have to uh, we have to identify we have to learn the model from scratch in order to be able to use it then for our model based reinforcement learning techniques. And as I've mentioned also in the previous slide this is in particular true for uh, real physical systems for example in a control sense and this 
uh, objective here, all this, let's say, intermediate objective, of course, the overall objective of reinforcement learning in a control sense would be to find a control policy, which is maximizing our long-term reward. But when we want to apply model-based solutions, then, of course, our intermediate objective is to estimate the model M hat, which is giving us the best possible estimate of a future state and reward um, feedbacks from the environment. And in order to do so, we can utilize previous uh, observed experiences, experience in the sense of having a tuple uh, out of state, action and reward uh, feedbacks from the environment. Um, of course, actions are then taken from our policy. And in this case, uh, we can use that in order to derive a mapping. So if we are in a certain state, picking a certain action, what, um, oh, so assuming these would be here the inputs, and then the system identification task or supervised learning task would be to get an estimate and prediction what will be the successor state and the according reward for that. So this is then the intermediate task here for model learning and identification. And as we are operating in finite action state spaces, um, I see uh, yeah prime assumption of this today's and also of the previous lectures, we can, for example, derive a very simple uh, model of the state transition matrix uh, or the elements of that matrix, small p hat, and also of the reward uh, function by a lookup table approach by just counting the amounts, the times, how often I have transitions from a certain being in a certain state, picking a certain action, and then uh, how often I have a transit, uh, I have observed a transit to a new successor state xk plus one, and um, that is then divided by the total number of visits count. So by that I would get a real number between zero and one in order to obtain or in order to depict the state transition probability between x and x prime. And likewise, we can also do the same for the reward function. Of course, then we also sample here, uh, based on, on previous experience, the specific reward we would get being in state x, applying action u, and then again, we divide that by the number of uh, visit counts. So that would be then a very simple system identification solution for that finite action and state spaces. And since we also discussed the differences between deterministic environments and stochastic environments, we can also take that into account when we talk about the model class. So with the previous model, with that very simple, simple lookup table-based model, what we could set up there is a so-called distributional model because we have specific probabilities, so stochastic probabilities, in order to describe a random distribution. So here we would have full explanatory uh, power because we can completely depict P and R. However, we can also use simpler models, which uh, are called sample models, in order to not get the full stochastic uh, information of an MDP by P and R, but to receive certain realization series of these random distributions here. And as you may remember, in one of the previous lectures, we have also talked about the blackjack example, where it might be very difficult to derive a full distributional model because it's a uh, yeah, highly complex game depending on the previous game trajectory, so many uh, combinatorial details has to be taken into account, but it's maybe easy to derive just something like a blackjack simulator uh, based on a simple software, and then with that simple uh, software we could of course generate samples, which we can then use to derive that sample model. Yeah, on the contrary, we can utilize model-free reinforcement learning techniques 
in order to directly try to predict the value function in a prediction sense or also to drive an optimal policy in the control sense just from experience. And in this way we don't require a model of the MTP as an intermediate step but we're trying directly to fulfill this goal value function prediction or also uh, policy improvement. So we have discussed a couple of algorithms like uh, Monte Carlo control uh, where we directly worked with the episodic rewards, Zaza also Q learning. So all these techniques uh, don't require any model of the MDP environment, but are able to directly give us optimal uh, control solution or also predictions in terms of value functions or action value functions. And if we then summarize these two branches uh, in this diagram here, so first in order to get a, a state value estimate for the prediction case or policy for the control case, we can use experience uh, which we obtained from acting with the environment in the past by that direct reinforcement learning solution. So direct reinforcement learning is here referring to model free solutions like Zaza or Q-learning or we can do indirect reinforcement learning we have an intermediate step of model learning. So we use past experiences in order to derive that model, for example, by that very simple uh, lookup table approach, uh, and then use that model in order to, uh, to do planning. And then based on planning, we can also follow the same goal uh, of value and policy uh, prediction and control. And the today's lecture, will then focus on bringing together these two branches with its with their advantages and disadvantages trying to make an overall learning framework which is uh, better than just doing model based or model free reinforcement learning on its own and what are the specific advantages and drawbacks of model free and model based reinforcement learning so model-based reinforcement learning um, is of course very efficiently, can of course uh, very efficiently use limited amounts of experiences. We already discussed that also during the last lecture that for example by a replay buffer uh, we can use a batch learning in order to more efficiently use uh, past experiences which is not uh, possible in the model-free reinforcement learning. Also, since we need a model to do planning, uh, that model could be derived from uh, a priori knowledge. So, for example, if we have a certain reinforcement learning task and we have available pre-knowledge, expert knowledge about this MDP of that environment we are interacting with, we can also um, insert that model knowledge for a model-based reinforcement learning so we don't have to just work with these uh, very simple models as we have um, discussed before but we can also throw in some uh, for example software simulator as we have discussed for the blackjack case or if we have any control engineering based problem we could provide a state space um, description of the model and therefore then use that pre knowledge in order to uh, foster the training and learning process. And of course, um, if we use uh, experience which we obtain during the interaction with the environment, we can also reuse that experience for other purposes. So if we derive a model along the way based on empirical data we have obtained from the environment, we could then also use that model, for example, for monitoring. And so for uh, trying to evaluate if the internal model behavior is changing over time, stuff like that. On the other hand, uh, model-free uh, solutions, uh, if you especially remember the simplicity of Q-learning, it's, it's super simple to implement. So we only have one task, value prediction or control improvement, and we can directly fulfill that task, we can directly follow it, and we don't need to have that intermediate step of working with a model or, in most cases, first derive that model based on experience. And because we don't have that 
model learning problem and of course during this model learning um, there could be any uh, estimation errors we have maybe uh, especially at the very early stage of learning a model we may have only a very inaccurate model which gives us some model variance or model bias problem and of course if we work with model free uh, problems uh, with model free reinforcement learning solutions we don't have these problems in particular so these are the let's say two frameworks and ideally of course we want to implement both of them so having the simplicity especially here the easiness of model free reinforcement learning solutions and the uh, data efficiency plus the possibility of integrating a priori knowledge of model based solutions and bringing that together is then the idea of the next topic which we will discuss and this is a Dyna learning framework which is yeah, just integrating planning acting and learning so the uh, general Dyna architecture is summarized here in figure 7.6 it was also invented by Richard Sutton, uh, which is one of the two main authors of our main uh, literature uh, resource, also here depicted again as a source of that figure. And the Dyna framework is a very broad, let's say, class of integrating possibilities of indirect and direct reinforcement learning. So here on that slide we see, let's say, the broad idea of bringing everything together and then in the subsequent uh, slides we will see also one specific example on how to do this integration. So again uh, we have here the two branches on the left side um, using real experience we can obtain or we can perform direct reinforcement learning updates and we can use that real experiments also here on the right hand side that would be then our indirect reinforcement learning branch to learn a model and then use that model in order to simulate experience and use that simulated experience by planning also to do uh, policy improvements or action value state value predictions and we will see how we can bring together these two approaches on the next couple of slides and um, as I said that Dyna framework can uh, be uh, this is just a framework and we can have many different flavors in order how to bring together the different steps here and basically uh, the the differences between the specific Dyna agents between the specific Dyna implementations are then according to the way how we do the direct reinforcement learning how do we do the model learning and the search control in order to obtain simulated experience so these three points here are basically the degrees of freedom in order to derive a specific diner agent yeah so let's um, discuss then these three points a little bit more in detail so the direct reinforcement learning update could be any model free reinforcement learning agents like QLearning Zaza from the previous lectures so this would be this point here then model learning so using real experience and then derive a model can also have many different flavors so we already saw in the table or case we could derive that very simple distribution uh, model just by counting how many state action transitions and uh, what kind of rewards we retrieved along the way and then trying to obtain a very simple distribution model we could use as we have also discussed the last of the uh, second last lecture um, experience replay buffers to save previous experience and then just reapply it in some batch learning way to uh, derive that model here or also you know, as that will be then under discussion uh, starting at the next lecture we could use function approximators in terms of supervised learning or system identification in order to derive let's say more uh, more complex models however today we will stick we will we will completely stick to the discrete state in action spaces and therefore this is more like an outlook here 
So that could be possible approaches then for um, model learning. And then search control, last but not least, this point here. Uh, these are then the strategies, how we are generating simulated experience in order to do planning steps. Because if we have a model, we have uh, different degrees of freedom, how to use that model and then um, yeah, add up to that simulated experience buffer here. Uh, for example, if you remember the uh, idea of exploring starts in the Monte Carlo framework, um, we could utilize or reutilize that idea of exploring starts in order to um, initialize that model in different states or in specific different states in order to derive information rich experiments here, information rich experiences, uh, which will then improve the learning process and together with the simulated experience and real experience and over the indirect and direct reinforcement learning we try to yeah just get a better reinforcement learning solution as uh, if we would just use one of the tools for themselves so this is as i said the specific uh, framework uh, the the general framework without any specific implementation and we will now see one possible uh, implementation variant of diner which is called the diner q agent where as the name already says uh, says we will work with a q learning in the uh, direct model reinforcement in the direct reinforcement learning way and we will use a very simple uh, experience buffer as a model m hat but we will see the details on this slide and also on the upcoming slide. So to use the DynaQ algorithm, we of course have a couple of parameters. We, uh, for the incremental implementation of the learning, we again need that parameter alpha here, our learning rate. We introduce a number of learning step parameters, n, which is yeah, just the number of how many planning steps using that internal model m hat here are uh, performed before the agent is interacting again with the real environment so this is then here denoted by the small n and um, dyna q as our direct reinforcement learning component of that dyna example here is q learning um, because uh, yeah, Q-learning is acting on the action values, we of course need some action value uh, initial estimates, Q-hat, which again can be um, initialized to the normal rules, arbitrarily accept that terminal states has to be set to zero. Then we can yeah, perform dynaq learning um, with respect to some episodes. In each episode we can initialize our state, uh, if possible or maybe the environment will initialize some certain state by itself and then we will run through these yeah let's say clustered loops here so from a soft policy queue we will then choose a certain action uh, being in a, start, uh, in a state xk we will then uh, take that action observe the feedback in terms of reward and state feedback then we will do the uh, learning the let's say direct learning path uh, as we have already discussed it in the simple or normal straightforward Q learning so this line here would be just using that real experience experience from the interaction with the environment and to perform Q learning step and then we will also take that tuple here of state action reward and successor state and save it in a model and this model as i've mentioned in the let's say simple diner q implementation is just a replay buffer so just a big storage of previous uh, examples of this tuple here of state state transition action and rewards and then here in this innermost loop this for loop going up to n steps so n is here again the number of internal planning steps we perform uh, before we obtain a real new interaction with the environment so this is then internally done so what we will do is we will sample randomly uh, some state which is saved inside that replay buffer here and we will then also 
uh, randomly sample an action which uh, has been taken in the past according to that state which was sampled before. So of course in a um, deterministic environment having also maybe in a deterministic or mostly deterministic um, action um, policy uh, if, if we are running epsilon greedy of course there might be some differences here but very often this pair here of action and state will be very close of course except that um, epsilon greedy policies have given us a random action and taking these two uh, as inputs to our model we can then obtain from previous experiments um, or experiences what have been the reward to that and what have been the successor state to that and with that you know, internal model knowledge we can then perform an internal model based update step in terms of Q-learning which is basically then in this case just an reapplication of already sampled previous exper experience by that um, experience model M. So the three uh, degrees of freedom of the Dyna framework as I said was direct reinforcement learning update. As the name already says here we are using Q-learning as a specific example. However, we could also use other types of direct reinforcement learning updates such as Zaza. The model is just a simple memory buffer of previous real experience, but we could also put in any other type of model which will uh, lead to the same purpose. And the third strategy here is also very simple. Uh, we are just taking random choices from that model buffer. So now, if we summarize these three degrees of freedom in terms of the Dyna framework, we can state that Dyna Q is somehow a very basic, a very baseline integration approach of bringing together direct reinforcement learning and indirect reinforcement learning just to get a first intuition here. So we can scale that up also to more sophisticated integration methods. Yeah, a hint here is that uh, by nomenclature we have called these internal planning steps uh, also as small n. And this has to be delimited from the n step bootstrapping, as we have discussed uh, last week. So, n step bootstrapping is uh, something different. Of course, same symbol, but two interpretations. n step bootstrapping was here how many uh, real sampled uh, rewards steps we take into account before we will use a bootstrap estimate in order to perform some value or action value estimation and here with this n in the Dyna framework we refer now to the internal planning steps before we operate again uh, with the real environment. So today for the integration of, of planning and learning we don't need or we don't look specifically into n step bootstrapping so um, if you see on any slides today small n you can uh, directly directly interpret it uh, as that internal number of steps for the Dyna framework the algorithm we have depicted one slide before is basically also just an extended case of the one step Q learning so if we remove the model basically what you receive would a Q learning based on real experience without any internal model usage and the main characteristics as I said is that we will do model based learning n times before we stick to a new real environment interaction the previous real experience is reapplied to Q-learning and that can be somehow considered as a background task. So Diner and specifically also Diner Q is a background planning approach. So we use the time which we have uh, on our computational hardware. So if we have a, for example, control task again, that could be an embedded microprocessor which is triggered every microsecond or something in order to um, derive a new uh, action, a new control input. And we could use DynaQ or the internal DynaQ steps in order to speed up the, the learning process based on previous real experiments. And we could try to apply so many uh, steps n as possible before 
the controller is trigger, triggered again in order to prevent turnaround task errors. So this is what we refer to background task planning. We have a degree of freedom here with the number of internal learning steps n, uh, which we can tune accordingly to our application. So if I have less time uh, in, in the background task, I would choose a rather small n, or if I have, let's say, last time, uh, big time scales before a new control action, before a new action has to be picked, then I can uh, choose n rather high and therefore uh, perform more internal learning steps. And of course, the uh, previous model, uh, especially with the uh, memory buffer, simple memory buffer, was assuming inherently that we work on uh, that we work on deterministic environments. However, if we want to extend that uh, DynaQ framework also to stochastic environments, we can use a very simple distributional model as we have seen in equation 7.3 in one of the previous slides. And then the update rule, of course, as we are operating in stochastic environments may be modified also to uh, expected updates to reduce variance problems. Yeah, here we have a small maze example. So very classically, some grid world, we have a starting state, we have a goal state, gray blocks here are some obstacles which cannot be uh, entered by the agent. And of course, again, the goal is to reach the goal uh, target state here as, as soon as possible. We have actions going uh, east, west, north, south, and uh, we receive a plus one uh, positive reward when we receive the target state. The task is episodic, uh, 0.95 uh, gamma factor, step size is given 0.1. We operate with uh, epsilon greedy in Q-learning, so epsilon is here 0.1. And these learning curves, which are depicted here, are averaged over a couple of uh, individual runs in order to uh, compensate for individual stochastic influences, for example here by uh, the expiration randomness. And what we can see here basically are three learning curves, either applying n equals zero. So in this case, as we have stated in the previous slide, we would get the direct reinforcement learning only. So simple Q learning, uh, as we have discussed already in previous lectures. And then n equals five or n equals 50. So using DynaQ with internally five model-based learning steps or 50 model-based learning steps. And as we can see here in this uh, maze example that with the increasing number of internal planning steps uh, over the number of episodes that the learning is performed much more quicker. So here are the steps per episodes which I needed to find the goal state and um, I believe here for the 50 planning steps after, um, if I remember right, I believe after three episodes the agent already has obtained the optimal policy in order to find the goal state as quick as possible. And of course, if you compare that here to the simple um, queue learning without any internal planning steps, we can yeah, observe an improved learning by at least uh, one order of magnitude in terms of the learning speed. If we then also compare these uh, two extreme, or not extreme cases, but these two cases from the previous slide without planning N0, with planning N50, basically uh, what we can see here are the uh, policies uh, after, after the agent being half through the second episode. So the first episode has been completed already and the uh, agent, which is depicted here by that uh, black dot, is um, yeah, going through the second episode. And all blue arrows here in that in that grid world example are denoting a specific policy uh, which is obtained by the Q learning. So if there's no error, that means that the uh, Q value for the four different available actions are uh, absolutely the same. So the agent cannot really distinguish because uh, all um, values or action values have been initialized to zero. And if there is an, a distinct error, then there is already a distinction possible between the action values and we can obtain an optimal policy.
And uh, what we can learn here from this uh, figure is basically that the internal, um, that the DynaQ agent, which is using internal planning, has after that very first episode already a lot of uh, specific uh, policy steps or policy information steps, which it can use in order to find the optimal policy much more quicker than without any internal planning. So simple queue learning. So the number of uh, states which are updated within that first real episode are much, much uh, more um, and therefore the DynaQ is learning faster. So basically this is just another depiction of the previous uh, example or of the previous uh, results from figure 7.7 .7 on the previous slide. But this is also yeah just making clearer that with internal planning I can just update my policy much much more quicker. Of course if we use a model uh, that model doesn't have to be accurate so it could be wrong. And what are the possible model sources, model error sources? If we are using an a priori model then uh, of course this is relying on some expert knowledge which we bring in into the modeling process and this expert knowledge may be wrong and of course then uh, the prediction which we which we do the planning which we do with the model is uh, not accurate the environment itself could change over time so if we have non -st stationary mdp problems of course a model which may be accurate at an early stage of the interaction with the environment becomes eventually non-accurate uh, due to changing internal environment behavior. One possible impact from real engineering uh, could be uh, aging, could be tier and weird to a system. So we may derive a certain uh, controller, a certain agent at the early stage of the system usage where the system is brand new coming out of uh, manufacturing. And then over the weeks, months and years, uh, tier and weird, uh, reduces some, let's say, performance measures of the system, parameter changes, the uh, system is behaving slightly different over time. And in this case, of course, the agent would have to adapt itself to these changing working conditions, which is basically translating to a non-stationary MDP problem. Yeah, if we have to first learn the model based on real experiments, um, especially when we have to initialize a model uh, based on, on no prior knowledge. So for example, if we have just an empty model buffer, experience buffer in DynaQ learning, then of course early stage model biases can decrease the learning success in the early stage of the reinforcement learning agent. This is something which we saw of course during all prediction problems throughout the lecture series. And we will also discuss that more in general uh, or more in details if we are using functional approximators, that functional approximator uh, may not be accurate itself because it is some parametric function trying to predict uh, what is happening based on a limited number of parameter uh, values and this can lead to so-called generalization error, so just a general inaccuracy which comes by functional approximation which can then of course be also a model error. So the consequences are more or less straightforward if we're having some type of model error, especially if it's very severe, the uh, model is completely deteriorated, then of course this is very likely to lead to suboptimal policies. So this is, let's say, the opposite of, the, of our assumptions which we have used for dynamic programming where we have assumed a perfect no model perfect model knowledge will lead to the perfect policy and if this, if this is not the case anymore if we cannot guarantee that we will receive suboptimal policies which also may uh, not converge which diverge uh, to nonsense uh, values especially if we use function approximators. If we are lucky then of course these errors are quickly discovered just by the internal you know, learning process so by DynaQ uh, we will just, for example, also forget some of the uh, old um, saved experience. For example, that, that model M which we have used just has, let's say, a storage of 100 tuples, state reward actions, and then um, has like something like a ring buffer such that the uh, initial um, model experiences are then overwritten 
uh, and therefore we may override false information from an early learning process and therefore trying to correct these things by the normal learning process. Hopefully that is that would be the uh, lucky case. And uh, however, as we have seen also with the Q learning, Dino Q learning case, that uh, applying random actions in an epsilon greedy uh, sense could be of course not the best way in order to find model errors because uh, this is yeah let's say the default very straightforward simple approach which is maybe not uh, able to detect model errors so quickly and we will see also this issue uh, shortly after or basically we will see it here already in the blocking maze example. So what is happening here in this example is that we will start with a grid world um, as depicted here. So we have a distinct starting and a goal state and a big obstacle in our way. So any agent which should move from S to G has to move along the way here on the, uh, west, uh, on the eastbound side. And then after 1000 time steps, which is here that dashed line, the internal uh, model behavior will change and this obstacle will move one step to the right. So this way then here is blocked. So if the agent uh, is going to follow its old way, uh, it will uh, be blocked here and has to learn the, let's say, strategy from new and dis eventually discover that now the uh, best or the only possible way is leading through that left corridor here on the westbound side. And basically what we see here are two Diner Q agents uh, competing against each other. Diner Q is exactly the same implementation, exactly the same agent as we have uh, presented uh, on one of the previous slides. So basically what we can see here that also the normal DynaQ agent is then is then able to detect that new gap here that changing environment on the left side however it requires <clears throat> some times because it's working with random exploration in the epsilon greedy sense so it really takes some time such that the uh, agent is let's say correcting its strategy always going here to the right hand side and eventually going to the left hand side. Dyna Q plus is then an updated or improved version of Dyna Q which we will then discuss in more details in the upcoming slides and uh, one of the main differences between the two is that Dyna Q plus is encouraging a more intelligent exploration uh, compared to Dyna Q with just simple uh, epsilon greedy random actions uh, in between and we will see the differences also in the next uh, slides here's also a second uh, example for changing environments um, again dyna q against dyna q plus and what is happening here the uh, starting conditions on the left hand side is more or less uh, the same we have starting and goal state in a grid world example and we have one specific uh, way on order in order to go behind this obstacle here and then eventually find the goal state and what is happening after 3000 time steps is now that we are giving a shortcut in that environment so that right state here or this the state at the right side is able to uh, is removed and therefore, obviously, the way on the uh, eastbound route is much more quicker compared to the westbound route. And in this example, we can see that DynaQ with simple epsilon greedy exploration steps is very likely to not find that shortcut because its primary way of going to the goal state here has been learned over the westbound route. And just with some simple random exploration steps in some states for example with 0.1 epsilon greedy factor won't or in, in very likely won't lead to any trajectory where the dyna q agent is going to the right bound route and then eventually finds the shortcut and therefore as we can see here in that example the performance of dyna q after 3000 steps where the shortcut is introduced into the problem is not improving so basically this straight lines tells us that Dyna Q is uh, with epsilon greedy uh, exploration is always taking the 
uh, westbound route. And DynaQ, uh, which we will then discuss on the next and over next slide, has a more intelligent um, expiration scheme and therefore is able to quickly find the shortcut here. And as we can see that that slope uh, regarding the cumulative reward is increasing and therefore we can um, evaluate, we can find that DynaQ was able to find the shortcut and then is staying to that shortcutted strategy. So what are the DynaQ extensions compared to the vanilla DynaQ? Basically two extensions. The first and um, more important extension is a search heuristic, which is, uh, let's say, also not the top-notch expiration um, methodology, but it's, let's say, even much more better than simple um, epsilon, uh, var, uh, epsilon greedy search. And basically what we do is we add an additional yeah, offset term to our reward you know, for exploration and this offset term to the reward is kappa times the square root of tau whereas tau is the number of time steps the state action transition had not been tried so basically we have a memory over the entire state action space to see what um, state actions combinations we didn't um, try it out in the past and kappa is just a small scaling factor in order to to tune the um, trade-off between that additional offset term here to the reward and the uh, normal reward of the environment where we want to reach the goal state. And with that simple search heuristic, basically, especially over that tau, with that memory of, um, let's say, seldom state action transitions, where the agent is encouraged to keep testing all accessible transitions so basically what will happen that these state action transitions which have been not visited or not taken uh, over a very long time for these state action combinations the tau factor will increase and increase and increase in an uh, integrative way and therefore the agent is encouraged to keep testing all accessible transi trans uh, transitions and therefore was also able to find the best possible um, shortcut in the previous example. Second um, extension of DynaQ compared to vanilla Dyna is that uh, we have a very, let's say, simple-minded model for actions given states that never have been tried before. So basically we have an internal model representation for state action combinations which not have been yet uh, explored by the agent and the initial model for these uh, actions are then that the uh, assumption, so this is just a basic internal DynaQ plus agent assumption, is that the actions will lead back to the same state without reward. So we can use them in the simulation based planning of DynaQ plus, but uh, it is a very simple model just to, to get things running. However, as we could saw from the previous two examples in the grid world case, that DynaQ plus compared to DynaQ vanilla can give us some speed up, especially due to that more intelligent exploration search compared to very simple epsilon greedy random action. Yeah, after we have gained some insights into the integration of planning and learning in the Dyna framework, we are now going to extend the uh, Dyna idea by two uh, items. The first item you see is so-called prioritized sweeping, which will try to increase the learning efficiency. The reason for that is that in the DynaQ or in the vanilla uh, Dyna framework, we have seen that uh, we have randomly drawn samples from the memory buffer in order to perform updates and of course especially at the early training stage there will be a lot of zero value state updates in that memory buffer and applying these updates and is more or less pointless because also internally we don't learn something if we update zero value state estimates with other zero value state estimates from the memory buffer. So and this will be especially in large state action spaces uh, will be often the case because uh, during the early training these um, will be the default and therefore there will be a large degree of inefficiency regarding the training. 
And we could try to focus, therefore, on uh, more important updates, either in episodic tasks, using a backward focusing approach, starting from the goal state, because we yeah um, have found the goal, and we can then go backwards um, following a certain trajectory of state action uh, transitions, and then update along that way, or also in continuing tasks, we could try to prioritize such updates, which are likely to have a big impact on our state value estimate. And this idea of focusing on important updates is called prioritized sweeping. And is basically, uh, or this idea, uh, this method can be summarized by these three bullet points here. So we build up a queue out of uh, state action pairs um, and we will try to estimate the amount of a uh, state action value change if we apply an update based on that state action pair and then we will prioritize the updates according to that uh, size of the change and also throw out such state action pairs which have an uh, only minor impact on our state action estimate um, and uh, therefore we'll try to focus our computational uh, performance or computational uh, demand on the more important updates. The algorithmic implementation of prioritized sweeping um, attached to DynaQ is in many ways uh, similar to the DynaQ implementation uh, and therefore I want all, only to uh, emphasize the differences here to DynaQ. Uh, in terms of the initialization of the algorithm we need a threshold parameter theta which is that threshold regarding the impact of a certain action state update. And if that threshold is not met, that update will be uh, discarded. And our Q, uh, which is here a yeah, modified Q symbol in order to denote the, or in order to distinguish that from our Q values, uh, action values. Yeah, the uh, updates, uh, let's say externally by the uh, vanilla, uh, by the vanilla Q learning, but also internally, uh, especially by the Dana Q approach, are then more or less uh, similar. The uh, two big differences are uh, on the one hand here, where we yeah calculate how large the change of the action value uh, estimate will be if we um, perform an update to a specific uh, state action um, combination and we, note, uh, we denote that change of the Q value by P and then we will check if that change of the Q value estimate is greater than our threshold parameter and if yes then we will throw in that uh, state action pair in our Q with the according priority and then the internal learning step is um, shown here. We will then not randomly draw our samples out of the memory buffer, but, and this is the uh, other big um, change here, is we will look in uh, to our queue and um, will extract such an state action pair which has the maximum priority. Again, with this state action pair, we will then um, get from the memory the according reward and successor state from uh, previous uh, episodes, from previous experience. With that, we can then perform the Q estimate update. And then here internally, or that for loop, we are doing something like an, yeah, I would call it internal planning, bootstrapping, where we indicate if the um, state if there are any other state transition leading to that x tilde here so to our internal uh, state which we have um, obtained by the uh, maximum priority over our q if there were any other um, in um, yeah, starting states and action which were leading uh, to x tilde here and if so we will then uh, go through the um, to the queue again and predict if any of these uh, state action um, pairs here could be also used for an additional learning step. So basically 
um, DynaQ plus some improved search strategy. Yeah, the threshold parameter theta becomes therefore an important hyperparameter, which can be tuned by the uh, data scientist, by the engineer, and the prediction step um, regarding that x tilde, which I've um, discussed, is then basically a backwards search in the model buffer in order to uh, speed up the learning even a little bit quicker. And again, for that simple uh, model buffer which we have used, we have to assume that we are working on a deterministic environment. And if we want to extend a prioritized sweeping also to stochastic environments, we should use a distributional model as we have discussed in equation 7.3 today. And therefore also maybe take into account that we want to change our sample based update rule to an expected uh, update rule. Yeah, finally, on priority sweeping, we all, all also want then to compare that against DynaQ. And uh, what we have uh, done here, or, or what, what we see here, is basically the same environment as in figure 7.7, .7, so a grid world case with an obstacle. And on the uh, x-axis, we have different sizes of the grid world in terms of the states. So and what is compared now is the vanilla DynaQ against prioritized sweeping, and both uh, variants are able to take up to five internal uh, prediction steps. And we can see here that for all model sizes, prioritized sweeping is able to converge much, much quicker uh, until uh, the optimal solution. So for the given grid world uh, size example, to get the optimal policy and the Depending on the specific model size, we can find that prioritized sweeping finds the optimal solution roughly five to ten times quicker. And uh, this is, uh, I believe, a very strong argument in order to make the internal updates of the Dyna framework more intelligent and therefore to boost up the overall learning speed. Yeah, in the next section, I would like to introduce some update variants to the uh, Dyna framework. And here especially, I would like first to highlight that, of course, in Dyna Q, we have performed in learning tasks in terms of the optimal policy uh, based on sample updates. So this would be basically this uh, block here so we want to estimate q star based on sample updates so this was basically the Dyna framework including q learning which we have evaluated in the last couple of slides however the Dyna framework in general is also capable of targeting any other quantity of interest so we can uh, also plug in a fixed policy in order to make a prediction on the action value or on the state value or we could also if we incorporate expected updates then also try to estimate uh, v star so the state values so therefore the Dyna framework just to emphasize that again is uh, very broad and is not fixed only to a Q learning based solution but also to many other solutions as well um, as we can see here in figure 7.12. Another important um, difference which we will discuss in the next two or three slides is that of course for uh, one goal uh, for example for getting the uh, optimal Q value we could implement sample based updates or expected updates and this is of course an interesting degree of freedom. So what could be the pros and cons for expected and sampled updates uh, regarding the expected updates? Uh, of course, uh, we have a much a more accurate uh, value estimate because we don't uh, provide any sampling error uh, due to, to variance problems. However, the sample updates are, <clears throat> of course, computational much more cheaper. We don't need to... Uh, provide any distributional model and we, owned, uh, we also don't have to evaluate that distributional model during runtime. Therefore, if we compare these two arguments here, we can perfectly state that the question regarding expected and sampled updates in 
the DINA framework, but also in general, is basically an uh, estimation versus uh, estimation accuracy versus computational burden uh, trade-off, uh, which will then both interact with the overall learning speed uh, and learning performance of a given algorithm. And the question can be basically transferred to if I having a given uh, decision problem uh, with a given state uh, action uh, space, um, should I evaluate this with expected or with sample based updates? And this question might be answered or might be evaluated by the so-called branching factor B, which is a metric uh, which corresponds to the number of possible next states x prime with a probability greater than zero of uh, when we are in a certain state and applying a certain action u. So this is basically the branching factor is therefore giving us, let's say, in metric on uh, how large our action state space is. And by the rule of the thumb, one can find out that an expected, if an F expected update is available to our problem, that um, this will be roughly as accurate as we would apply B sampled updates. So that would be the, let's say, break even point between expected and sampling updates. Therefore, this branching factor B is also a yeah, very interesting metric. And also as a rule of uh, thumb, if only incomplete expected updates uh, are available, then we should prefer the sampling solution, which uh, normally applies to the large state action space problems. Here's also a yeah, very uh, slight uh, comparison between the expected and sampled updates, where we have a yeah, very uh, arbitrary so, uh, artificial prediction task where uh, all B successor state uh, of an MDP are just equally likely to occur. And we start with an initialization depending uh, out of that a value estimation task here in order to compare sampled and expected updates such that at the uh, initialization all comparison algorithms or comparison approaches which we take here into account have same RMS error, so root mean squared error here of 1. And what we can see here, so these colored lines are the sample based updates for problems with different uh, branching factors and this gray box here would be the expected update. So the expected update uh, is then only available for a 1B because that would be the number of computations I need to fulfill on the uh, Q value in order to get that expected update here. So therefore, the in this artificial problem, the expected update would jump uh, after that first evaluation, that first execution of the expected update to a zero RMS error. And the takeaway message here is that for small branching factors, so if there's only a, a few states I can transit to, that the difference between the expected update and the sampled based updates are comparable small. So in these cases, the expected update would be the uh, preferred solution, especially since when the expected update is carried out, that it has, of course, major accuracy improvements compared to the sample-based updates. On the other side, if my state action space is uh, rather large and therefore the branching factor is rather high, and then the sample based updates have a quite nice accuracy also for a rather uh, low number of um, max q computations here and therefore are preferred against the expected updates. So therefore the <coughs> takeaway message if, if we are facing large problems then we should use sample updates. Another question is then how to distribute that updates and therefore we can first recap. So in dynamic programming, we distributed our updates by a full width through the entire state action space. 
in Dyna Q as our let's say baseline for today, we have performed random uniform samplings by equal likelihood through our memory buffer. And of course, in both cases for dyna dynamic programming, where we took also into account the full width of the state action space and Dyna Q um, as discussed, are these large amount of irrelevant updates uh, where we don't have any significant input uh, or a sim significant impact in terms of our value updates. And there are might some alternatives in order to improve that learning uh, efficiency also. And that could be done by just updating according to the on policy distribution. So basically just along the encountered state action pairs, which we would then call triactive sweeping. Or if an on policy distribution is explicitly available, then really take that uh, information into account in order to distribute the updates along the way. And in both cases, we again would try to ignore a vast uninteresting part of the problem space and therefore uh, evaluate the state action pairs which seems to be most promising for us however uh, of course when i'm uh, following one of these two ideas here there is of course uh, also the risk of updating parts of the problem space all over again which have been already converged to some steady state value and i'm maybe missing uh, other interesting parts of the state space which i've discarded at an early stage but maybe have become more important to the problem over time and therefore there is this yeah, inherent risk of speeding up the learning uh, against kicking out parts of the problem space and therefore introducing the risk of not getting the optimal long-term policy. If we compare these let's say two basic ideas one is here uh, the uniform update so dyna q based updates uh, compared to the on policy updates in two cases uh, the one case is here for thousands states and the other case is for 10000 states where in every state so it's again a very artificial um, numerical example here and in every state there are just two actions both actions lead to B, so B again as a branching factor, next states, and for every state transition there is a 10% likelihood that this will then uh, by chance lead to a terminal state. Now for every transition in this artificial problem here we have a normal distribution where the specific reward is drawn from with zero mean and uh, the variance of one. And yeah, the task is here again to estimate the start value and 200 randomly generated undiscounted episodes are run in order to perform these graphs here. And the baseline is that when we follow an on policy distribution of our updates, so this would be this line for B equals one, this line for three or this for 10, that the on policy distribution is uh, very fast let's say in the early learning here for 10,000 states we can see it even better and is outperforming the uniform update distribution especially in the early computational stage however then depending on the branch factor b and the state space problem dimension then the uniform distribution in the long run will eventually take over uh, because it's preventing uh, biased information errors here. So therefore, again, basically the the question again is how big is the state space? If the state space is very bit, big, then we should perform our updates based on an on policy distribution uh, and therefore trying to give more weight, uh, more uh, interest to the um, interesting state action pairs and otherwise yeah the uniform uh, distribution updates as in dyna q are of course let's say a an, an safe choice but especially for the early uh, learning it may be not the optimal optimal one yeah with these 
uh, variants to DynaQ for test sweeping and other update variants. I now want to yeah, dig a little bit into the uh, excursion for today, which is planning at decision time. And planning at decision time is basically a second variant of how to integrate learning and planning. So far, all the uh, methods we have discussed for today are called background planning methods because we are gradually improving a policy or value function in the background. So if you remember, we could scale that internal planning parameter n uh, such that yeah, any controller or prediction task can be updated internally uh, such often that uh, any time constraint can be met. And yeah, this a background planning task is therefore then also attached with a backward view because we just reapply previous past experience all over away. It's also very much feasible for fast execution because these updates here are, as I said, um, are done in the background. So there is always a specific policy or value estimate available which we can execute. It may be not the optimal one, of course, because we are in the learning process. However, it is explicitly available and can be executed very fast and therefore we uh, obtain a low latency uh, response which is uh, very important, for example, for real-time control. Now the opposite, the title of this section, the planning at decision time, this is now the new idea of how to integrate planning and learning. And this is, uh, we try to select a single next future action through very accurate planning in a forward view. So we are going to predict future trajectories of our uh, state uh, action uh, space, uh, starting from a current state and then uh, eventually evaluate what next future action is the best choice. And uh, this term planning at decision time is coming from the reinforcement learning domain. However, as you may remember, our first uh, lecture where we had a broad overview about different reinforcement learning topics incorporating in comparison to model predictive control, this is pretty much model predictive control just with another name tag. Yeah, a characteristic of planning at decision time is that previous planning outcomes are typically discarded. So when a new, you know, when we have performed a certain um, state transition, we have to start from scratch and evaluate the new predicted trajectory again. So this makes the uh, computation also very costly. Um, however, if these trajectories, if these future uh, trajectories I'm going to predict from my current state uh, onwards are independent of each other, I nicely can parallelize it. Uh, so this is fitting nice to the uh, trends in computational hardware over the last decades. Uh, however, uh, it's still, as I said, computational demanding and is is attached to a high latency response. So uh, it is most useful if uh, not if we don't need a fast respo response, for example, in turn-based strategy games. And in the following, I would like to give you, let's say, first insights into possible uh, planning at decision time solutions. However, we will only scratch you at the surface. Yeah, the most simple idea in order to perform Planning at decision time is a heuristic search in a tree-like continuation, as we can see here in the figure. So we start in some base state and then evaluate different trajectories throughout the state action space, for example, uh, by some heuristic solution approach, by some heuristic uh, policy, and then if we have performed so many, uh, let's say, state action steps that any kind of metric is fulfilled, our time is up, or we uh, want only to perform a certain number of steps, then we approximate the uh, value function at the leaf node here by some uh, model, for example, and then back up through this uh, yeah, tree-like uh, structure here to the root node, and then uh, choose that action 
only the next action so either in this case either the left action here or the right action which is predicted to have the highest value in terms of that long-term value at the leaf nodes and then uh, when we perform one of these two actions which seems to be the most appropriate one to us then uh, normally we will transit of course to a new state and from this new state we will then uh, eventually start all over again and the search tree is discarded a variant to these tree-like continuations are so-called rollout algorithms which are of course similar but they simulate directories following to a specific rollout policy which is um, depicted here in this diagram that for the continuation over a certain number of state action transitions that these follow a certain um, rollout policy which is uh, improved over time. The rollout algorithm is therefore tightly connected to a Monte Carlo estimates. Uh, if you remember, we could also use Monte Carlo estimates not only to provide estimates of the state value and state action value of the entire problem space, but only to specific states. And that can be nicely used here in the uh, planning at decision time framework to use the Monte Carlo estimate idea and then yeah back up again to our initial current state and then choose the best uh, action uh, based on these Monte Carlo based uh, estimates with uh, in combination with the rollout policy. Also here the predictions are normally discarded so in every new state the uh, rollout algorithm has to be done from scratch. And to make that a little bit, let's say, uh, to increase the learning and not to discard all the entire predicted trajectories here, we can use Monte Carlo Tree Search, which accumulates value estimates from former MC simulations, so from Monte Carlo simulations. So we don't throw away all that information which we have gathered um, before. And we not only using a rollout policy but as additionally also an informed tree policy. The four steps of Monte Carlo tree search can be summarized as here. We first have a selection step which is yeah, denoted here by this blue uh, arrow line. So we use our informed tree policy which we are trying to optimize. That could be for example some type of epsilon greedy policy. Um, which will lead us from the uh, root node to some leaf node where uh, we then evaluate if it makes sense to bring in a new action or if we follow the, the path until we meet some other root node. So in this example here, the uh, tree policy was ending at this state and during the expansion step, which is only optional, uh, but in this example the expansion step has been carried out, a new uh, action is being evaluated. And then if we really eventually meet one of the root nodes we will use the rollout policy as we also did with the rollout, basic rollout algorithms uh, one slide before and then use that simple rollout policy which could be an a simple heuristic or just random actions which we then apply until the episode is terminated. So this triangular here should depict that a given episode is terminated and um, then we will finally of course uh, as we have learned in the Monte Carlo uh, lecture we will back up our state values and action values to our uh, root node here and the uh, yeah, interesting thing or the interesting detail here regarding Monte Carlo tree search is that this backup updates are not carried out for the rollout policy. So the ro rollout policy is just let's say a heuristic to quickly finish that period here, this this episode here, um, and therefore we are not really interested in improving the rollout policy, but we're interested in improving the tree policy, and therefore the Monte Carlo style updates are only carried out inside the tree uh, which have been 
uh, traveled by the uh, tree policy. So if you summarize that again, the four basic uh, working steps of Monte Carlo uh, tree search, we have first the selection step. So we are starting at the root node. We use our tree policy and then travel through the tree until we are arriving at the leaf node. So therefore we are exploiting auspicious tree regions while we maintain some degree of exploration by epsilon greedy. So we um yeah we, we just travel through or we very likely travel through these parts of our state space problem which are important to us by the informed tree policy and therefore use our computational resources wisely. And this role all uh, this tree policy is then improved and possibly as we will see in the in the next extension step uh, in every simulation run. The expansion is then adding a child node to a leaf uh, by evaluating unexplored action. So this is a possible step. We don't have to do it. This is the degree of freedom, how often and how we want to incorporate these expansion steps. And then the simulation is of course not optional, that has to be fulfilled. We use our rollout policy to run the full remaining episode until termination and then yeah, just see where we're ending. And the rollout policy, as I said, could be random or some pre-trained heuristic uh, in order to um yeah finish the episode in some um in some way. And then finally, the backup, of course, as we have learned from Monte Carlo, update the values along the travel trajectory, but only we save those which are within the tree policy. Of course, we also have to calculate the, the values, action values along the simulated uh, rollout policy, but these are then completely discarded and only these uh, along the informed tree policy are really saved. And uh, yeah, this is then especially giving us this idea of a forward planning uh, approach together with using real experience from um, uh, from the past, which could be used here for the simulation uh, step. But this is of course something completely different compared to the background uh, planning task as we have got to know during the Dyna framework discussion. Yeah, and then uh, what is happening after reaching the feasible simulation runs? So um, this is basically then, okay, we have uh, fulfilled a lot of learning episodes through the four-step MCTS procedure. And then, of course, we have to pick an appropriate action that could be to some arbitrary metric. But, of course, the two intu intuitive choices would be to take that action which was uh, most uh, visited during all simulation runs or also to take an action which just has the largest action value. And then after we are transitioning to a new state, the MCTS procedure starts either with a new tree incorporating only the root node or of course we could also just reutilize the applicable parts of the previous tree. So this is then also bringing over some uh, pre-experience from the last step to the new step. As I said, uh, we are only scratching on the surface on uh, planning at decision time algorithms because um, as I said we have a more let's say control oriented focus in this lecture and as I've um, mentioned that um, planning at decision times with these uh, huge amounts of uh, predictions of, of future trajectories are normally not capable of real-time control and therefore uh, are not in our main interest. However, they have become uh, quite well known, for example, in combination with uh, the usage of games, in particular the famous AlphaGo algorithm, which was able to outperform the human grandmasters in the Asian game of Go. And um, I've linked here a very interesting uh, keynote lecture from David Silver which is really explaining on a technical detail level how they built up the Carlo uh, tree search algorithm uh, for AlphaGo and I really can recommend this keynote lecture here. Moreover, I have also attached here some uh, nice in-depth lectures which are completely focusing on MCTS 
approaches as a very promising category of, of algorithms in the field of planning at decision times, which are summarized here. So we have one from Stanford, MIT, and also from a university in Paris, which uh, really focus in uh, in details on these uh, algorithms. So if you're interested to get more information on that, please feel free to uh, click on these links here. And with that, uh, yeah, outlook to possible more literature for you. I would also then summarize the today's lecture. So we have recapped the differences between model free and model based reinforcement learning and have discussed that model free, of course, is very easy to implement. We like that. But on the other hand, model based solutions are uh, much more efficient in their data usage. And we would like to focus these we would like to integrate these two advantages of the two domains. And we have done that by uh, the DINA framework in a background planning manner. So we um, do additional learning in the background in between two real interactions with an external environment. And the three basic steps of the DINA framework were the direct reinforcement learning update, which could be any model free approach. In our case, we have today focused on the Q learning and therefore DynaQ. We have model learning. So how to use real experience in order to improve model predictions, which we can use for indirect reinforcement learning. And then the question about search control, how to distribute also updates, uh, and therefore on strategies, how to generate simulated experience and uh, this was largely linked to the question how to speed up the learning process. Yeah, the DINA framework allows, as I said, many different flavors um, regarding the, the goal of the learning process. We have um, focused here on, on Q-learning. However, as we saw also one of the previous slides, we could also uh, use it for um, the prediction of the state value, no problem. However, yeah, we have focused on uh, DynaQ with variants regarding DynaQ plus or also prioritized sweeping in order to increase the learning efficiency compared to some random uniform uh, update rules during the internal uh, updates of the DynaQ framework. And last but not least, we have also seen that in contrast, planning at decision time has a very strict forward view. It predicts future trajectories starting from the current state and therefore uh, is trying to use a um, uh, fusion of model-based um, knowledge and also incorporating previous experience in order to boost up that model accuracy in order to find optimal uh, solutions, optimal actions. However, this prediction normally requires a lot of computational resources, is therefore computational expensive, leading to high latency responses, um, and therefore is something which um, is very well suited for non-time uh, constrained decision problems. And here in particular, we have uh, learned that Monte Carlo Tree Search is a well-known rollout algorithm, which became a famous among other examples on uh, games in particular, the uh, AlphaGo example has been discussed. And with that, I would like to kindly thank you for your attention today. Uh, I hope you have learned a lot about the integration of model-free and model-based reinforcement learning solutions. And I wish you again a pleasant week. See you soon. Bye-bye.